the mystery of a woman, a savior in a time. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight. She really doesn't need an introduction, but um, Forbes magazine named her the, f the 40th most powerful woman in the world and one of Africa's most powerful women. Dr. Joyce Banda was the first female president of Malawi and the fourth president of Malawi. Throughout her political career, she advocated greatly for women's empowerment, establishing a sense of equality for women in social, educational, and economical environments. Dr. Joyce Banda is also the founder of the Joyce Banda Foundation, which works to empower local Malawian women by helping them become financially independent. And to most of us young women from Africa, Dr. Joyce Banda is still our president. Please help me welcome to the, to the podium, Dr. Joyce Banda. Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Nigeria to the US, Retired Chief Justice Richard Banda, my dear daughter and sister Lillian, fellow honorees, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have noticed that uh, all those that came to the podium were very, very brief. So I've left my speech behind. And I will also try to be as brief as I can. Let me take this opportunity to thank God for this day. And to thank you, Lillian, for your love. It is my pleasure to sit here and see younger women come to the podium and receive awards. Because, as I've always said, as far as I'm concerned, the leadership is about the young. The young leaders are leaders of today, not of tomorrow. But that's what sometimes in Africa we want to tell our leaders, young leaders, to say they should wait we postpone their participation in decision making. I want to thank those that decided that I should receive this award, and I don't take it for granted. And I receive it on behalf of my constituency. My constituency is the rural women and children of Africa. 10 years ago, I was invited to come to the World Bank and uh, we were discussing MDGs 3 and 5, particularly MDG 3. There was concern, why was it that um, it wasn't moving as fast as other MDGs? And in my submission that day, I said, we shall not be able to achieve MDG 3 particularly where I come from, if we don't take a holistic approach. And usually those of us who are leaders in Africa sometimes feel that uh, nobody is listening to us. But isn't it a shame that next week, starting from tomorrow, we shall be in New York at the CSW, 20 years after Beijing, taking stock of what we have achieved on the platform for action that we drew in Beijing. But isn't it a shame that uh, those two that we shall not have achieved are the ones that relate to women, MDG3 and MDG5. I have worked in the women's movement at grassroots as an activist, as an entrepreneur, and in public life. And I have worked with women at all levels. And I want to report that where I come from, in Africa, whether women are poor or, or not, not educated, but they definitely know what they need to do to change their situation. And I want to assure you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that my fellow African women at, at, at grassroots, they are not just sitting there waiting for handouts. They know what they should do to change their situation. And so, as an advocate and their voice, what I've always asked the West to do, our sisters and brothers here, 
is to come into Africa and forge partnerships with us. It saddens me sometimes when people come and believe that they can do it for us. But I also respect those that come and forge smart partnerships with us and work with us because we know exactly what to do. Lillian is here and all those on Riz that you saw know what they should do to change the situation of women in Africa. And I hope that you can find it in your heart to partner with us and work with us to make that happen. So what do I mean by a holistic approach? I truly believe that the situation of women in Africa will only change if women are economically empowered. My mission in life is to assist women and youth gain social and political empowerment through business and education. And I believe that the situation of women in Africa will change when that household has money, when the women are given the opportunity to do business, when the women can participate in contributing financially to the household. Because when money gets into the house at grassroots, the girls are going to school. Because when resources are low, the boys are going, the girls are not going. And I have found that girls that have gone to school will also send their children to school. And the three areas that I, I have advocated for throughout my adult life have originated from personal experience in my life. So when I was growing up, going back to stay with my grandmother every weekend, I had a very good friend in the village who was just as bright as I was, going to the village school. We went all the way to primary school. We were selected to the best secondary schools. I went, the next time I came home for holiday, she wasn't by the roadside to meet me. And I was told that she had dropped out because the family couldn't raise the six dollars she needed to go to school. And I remember at that point saying, when I grow up, I will send as many girls as possible to school. My friend Chrissy, as I speak, she's where I left her. And I went all the way to State House. And I think that's not fair. And I think the education for the girl child is a human right. Number two, I believe that when girls to school, number three, pillar one is income so that the girls can go to school. Number three, pillar number, my pillar number three is maternal health and HIV AIDS. Because research has shown that when the girls don't go to school, the community is encouraging them to get married very early. And when they get, ma get married early, they are dying giving birth. My research has shown that those that are dying giving birth, maternal mortality, are uh, between the ages of 15 and 19. So keeping the girl child in school four more years is also saving her life. My pillar number four is leadership. I'm a living example of what can happen when you get into leadership. And I have also seen what has happened in Malawi. When I got into State House, the, I promoted as many women as possible. In fact, the Chief Justice of Malawi was a woman, I'm told she retired this week. The Solicitor General is a woman, the two inspector, deputy governors of the Reserve Bank are women, eight district commissioners, and the list goes on. Why? Because I believe that when women get into leadership, at all levels, they focus more on issues of women and children. My pillar number five is that of rights, and this is a cross-cutting pillar into the four pillars. I believe that women must have the right to have access to income and to control their income. And I believe that our girl child has the right to stay in school. And I believe that the girl child or the young lady must have the right 
to get married when she wants to and to have children at an age that is safe for her. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this model is what I have tried. The Joyce Banda Foundation was established 16 years ago when I received the Africa Prize in New York and the prize money was $50,000. And I took the 50000 back home and started a foundation because I believed that it didn't belong to me, it belonged to the women that had supported me. And as I speak, the Joyce Banda Foundation has reached 1.3 million Malawians. When I got into public office, I took advantage of the opportunity. As Minister of Gender, I championed the passing of the Domestic Violence Bill. This past week, Malawi takes pride that they also passed a law against marriage before the age of 18. My experience has shown that passing laws is one thing, but making sure that they are implemented is another. You can tell a girl child not to get married before 18, but she must have the means to go to school in order to stay away from marriage. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have been Minister of Gender, I've been Foreign Minister, I've been Vice President, and I've been President of a country. But all these are nothing if we leave the thousands of women behind. Because where I come from, the face of poverty is women. And therefore, it is my pleasure that younger women like Lillian are coming up and taking over from us. I established the Joyce Banda Foundation that runs schools. And celebrating 10 years, because it's now 16 years old, celebrating 10 years, there was a clip where there was this young Mrs. Joyce Banda dressed as I am. This eight-year-old girl child was going to a press conference. And the other students were the journalists and reporters. And so one of them asked this young Mrs. Joyce Banda and said, Mrs. Joyce Banda, you have achieved so much in your life. Now you are a foreign minister. What are your future plans? And this young, young girl said, oh my God, I wish I could now establish a university. I've established schools and I've established women's groups and the Joyce Banda Foundation has 550,000 rural market women, but I wish I could establish a university. But as you can see, I'm running out of time. And I listened to this girl and everybody laughed. I felt sorry for myself. And so indeed, allow me to end on that note. I am running out of time. <laughs> but there's still a lot of work to be done. And in Africa and everywhere else, women are in majority. I have had the privilege of getting a lot of support from men, even more than my, from my fellow women. And so what has been the missing link since Beijing, in 20 years, we have left out our brothers, and our brothers who should have assisted us to achieve more. And I would like to, 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 to say that as far as possible in this discussion, on this table, we must ensure that our men are sitting there and helping us achieve our platform for action. We have been talking to ourselves for too long. In any case, our men realize that we are in majority. But our men also appreciate that we brought into this world the other half. Thank you very much, distinguished ladies and gentlemen.